Okay, dear friends, my name is Dmitro Leontiev. I am from Kharkiv, from Ukraine. And the topic of our today's lecture is Myxomycetes at Klondike for the taxonomist. We will start from the very basic things, taking into account that not all of our listeners are closely familiar with Myxomycetes. So, Myxomycetes or plasmodial slime molds. Oh, wait, this is wrong. You should never say myxomycetes or plasmodial slime molds, as you can read in many old handbooks. Myxomycetes and plasmodial slime molds are not synonyms. To understand what is correct identification of these terms, let's start from the beginning. What are slime molds, or they also can be called mesetozoans, fungal animals? Slime molds are life strategy or the ecomorph, if you, if you like this term, which represent terrestrial fructifying amoeba. Any organism which has a life cycle, including airborne spore, amoeba or amoeba flagellate, and the fruiting body forming in terrestrial condition and containing airborne spores can be called slime mold or mycetazone. Any exclusion, for example, if the fruiting body is not forming in the terrestrial conditions or feeding stage is not represented by amoeba, any exclusion will also exclude the using of the term slime mold. You see that between amoeba and fruiting body, there is a question mark because there are different ways for amoeba to produce a fruiting body. First way, which is characteristic for the life strategy of cellular or better to say sorocarpic slime molds is that amoeba are collecting in the group, which is called pseudoplasmodium, Sometimes they can even move together. Sometimes they only collect together. And this group of amoeba is then transformed to the fruiting body, which is called sorocarp. Each cell of this fruiting body is actually a spore formed by individual amoeba. Another strategy Characteristic for plasmodial or better sporocarpic slime molds means that amoeba uh, remains individual. It may pass through the uh, sexual process, but still when two amoebas are emerging, one individual diploid amoeba emerges. And this amoeba start to grow, become multinuclear, sometimes very multinuclear, and then this amoeba, huge amoeba called plasmodium, is transformed to the fruiting body, which is called sporocarp. Sporocarp, in contrast to the sorocarp, is formed by the cellular division, because the plasmodium, which forms this structure, is unicellular, while the sporocarp contains many, many spores. Even if there is a smallest sporocarp with only one spore, a number of such sporocarps are formed by one plasmodium. So nevertheless, in all cases, sporocarps are formed by cell division. So here we see what are plasmodial slime molds. Are plasmodial slime molds only myxomycetes? Are they called myxomycetes? No, this is not correct. In the simplified eukaryotic tree of life, you can see on this slide, we can find several groups of sorocarpic or cellular and sporocarpic or plasmodial mycetozoans, slime molds. As you can see, the strategy of sorocarpic mycetozoan is more normal, at least six times this strategy independently emerged in different phylogenetic groups. First number, Infozoria called Sorogena, ciliate, which also can form fruit in bodies. These ciliates are not amoeba, of course, but we can consider them as very 
unusual flagellates and therefore include them in this uh, group of life strategies. Within Stradinopolis, there is only one genus, uh, Sorodiplophis. Within Rizaria, there is also only one genus, Gutulinopsis. Within Discoba, there is small, but including 10 or something species group, Acrazida. Within relatives of fungi, Christi Discoidea, there is only one genus, Fonticula. And within the supergroup Amoebazoa, there is a genus Copra Mixa and Dictyostelids. As for sporocarpic incitazoans, there are three groups, but all of them belong to the supergroup Amoeba Zoa. So plasmodial or sporocarpic metatozoans are all members of Amoeba Zoa. Nevertheless, I still state that they do not represent one group which can be called myxomycetes or plasmodial slime molds. Why? Let's have a brief description of the history of understanding of the slime mold diversity. In 19th century, in the first half of the century, myxomycetes were described as a taxonomic entity. They were known before, they were known even from 17th century, but as a taxonomic entity, as a subclass and then class, they were described in the first half of uh, 19th century. The cellular slime molds uh, were described in the second half of 19th century, and uh, in this period, they received a name Acrasiomycetes, also a class within the kingdom of fungi or kingdom of protista or kingdom of uh, plants, depending on the taxonomic concept used by the uh, definite taxonomist. In 1973, um, famous mixomycetologist uh, Rostofinsky separated mixomycetes on two subclasses, endosporic and exosporic, depending on the way of spore formation. In endosporic myxomycetes, all spores are formed within the sporotheca, a kind of sporangium, which is covered by its own peridium. For the exosporic myxomycetes, spores are formed on the surface of the fruiting body and do not have a common peridium. In 1970, Lindsay Olive discovered a third group of mycetozoans, which he called Protostelia. These guys were formed by plasmodia, but their fruiting bodies were microscopic and contained very low amount of spores from one to eight, mostly one or four because of uh, meiosis. In 1975, Olive realized that exosporic myxomycetes are actually very similar with protostelids. It looks like a group of protostelloid fruiting bodies, single spore fruiting bodies, are combined on one hypothalic structure. And he created the class protostelliomycetes, which include uh, microscopic protostelida and exosporic myxomycetes. From this point, myxomycetes were considered as a synonym of endosporia. So myxomycetes, the true myxomycetes, become to be considered as only endosporic organisms, while exosporic myxomycetes were understood as protostelliomycetes. In 1990s, the first phylogenetic researchers have shown that acrasiomycetes, cellular slime molds, do not represent a monophyletic group, and they were separated on dictyostelids and unclear mixed group of non-dictyostelloid acrasiomycetes. As a result of contemporary phylogenetic researches, a very complicated situation arose. Myxomycetes included several protostelloids, mostly those which contain two or four spores. Second group, serratial myxomycetes, included exosporic myxomycetes and some protostelloids. And dictyostelids 
which are cellular slime molds, were also included in the group, which is called now eumetazoa, true metazoans. This group is mostly considered as a phylum uh, with three classes, myxomycetes, seratiomyxomycetes, and dictyostelomycetes. At least this is a classification we published in 2019. But this is not the end because a lot of protostelids appear to be not closely related to seratiomyxomycetes. And now we know at least six independent branches of non-eumetazoan protostelloids, which belong to different branches of the supergroup amoebazoa. As for non-bictyostelloid acrasiomycetes, one of them, the genus Copramixa, is also non-eumetazoan amoebazoan, and the rest of them, which I mentioned before, uh, fanticula, Sporopidiopsis, and so they are not even amoebazoans. They are not related to this group at all. So most, but not all, of the slime molds belong to the supergroup amoebazoa. In the phylogeny provided by Kang et Ali in 2017, and used also by Saina Edel in 2019, amoebazoan are separated on three branches, tubulinia, evosia, and viscosia. And you can find slime molds in every of these branches, sometimes even in several sub-branches of each group. Let's see what are they. Within tubulinia, there is only one slime mold group, copramixida, which belong to the branch Elardia and are closely related to classical amoeba like amoeba proteus. Within Evoze, we see the phylum Eumetazoa, which includes only slime mold taxa, including myxomycetes, seratiomyxomycetes, and dictyostelomycetes. Those which are red are plasmodial, those which are blue are cellular. Also within Evoze, there is another branch called Variosia, where we can find at least three different orders of protostelloid slime molds. Protostelida, Fractavitelida, and Cavostelida. And within the third branch, Discosia, there are only several species of protostelloid slime molds which we can find within orders Vanellida, Pellitida, and Acant Amoebida. For the Acant Amoebida, it seems that they did not even create a separate uh, genus. Some of representatives of the genus Acant Amoeba form fruiting bodies with one spore. So, to make a brief conclusion of this part of the lecture, those groups which are marked by red color are plasmodial slime molds. As you can see, they belong to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight branches within amoeba zoa and do not represent a monophyletic group. As for myxomycetes, these are one of these eight branches. Therefore, you should never say myxomycetes or plasmodial slime molds. Let's go deeper to the taxonomy of myxomycetes. The traditional classification of this group was created in the beginning of 20th century and become canonic or even iconic in 1968, when Martin and Alexopoulos created their famous monograph, the myxomycetes. This is typically combinatoric classification based on the combination of characters. Basically, these were only three characters. The presence of capillicium, the threads 
inside the protein body, which help to disperse spores. Capelicium can be present or absent, very simple. Second character is lime, salts of calcium, which can be accumulated in protein bodies. No one knows exactly why they are accumulated. One of the popular but still unproven theories is that these are remnants of cytoplasmic calcium, which is necessary for actin myosin interaction while the plasmodium is moving. So the faster plasmodium moves, the more calcium it needs, and then this calcium cannot be accumulated in spores, so it is accumulated outside of spores, somewhere in the uncellular part of the fruiting body. And the last character is melanin, which is accumulated in spore walls and also in some other structures of the root fruiting body. It makes them, of course, brown or even black, and uh, it can be accumulated or not. In most of taxonomic groups in 20th century, such a uh, combinatorial classifications were created. And as we all know, in most cases, these classifications failed to describe the real evolutionary relations within the group. And this is also true for this traditional classification of myxomycetes, which failed in many important points. But to understand what's really going on with the phylogenetic relations within the group, someone must develop molecular markers for the molecular phylogeny. And this appeared uh, to be unexpectedly difficult because myxomycetes are a very old group. All the branches of this class are extremely old and this makes them very different. They went very far in forming their molecular individuality. For this reason, such markers as uh, ITS region cannot be used uh, for this group at all, but Irina Yetiuk is trying and got some success with it. But in general, ITS is too variable to check the phylogeny within the genus. So we use mostly the 18S RNA gene, which is still extremely variable. You can see the fragment of alignment of 18S. And you can see that in some points, it is actually inalienable. Or for example, here, I think the muft is thrown because it is shifted and uh, we are forced to exclude such parts of alignment from the phylogeny because in many cases we are not sure what is the right position. Another marker which seems to be good is elongation factor one alpha, but in spores it has very low concentration and it is not easy to catch it even if you have good primers. And uh, we have only spores because for most of myxomycid group, you cannot cultivate them at all. The third marker, which seems to be more or less useful is cytochrome oxidase one subunit. But this gene in myxomycids, as in most of amoebozoans, contains tra transcription edited deletions. Look at this alignment. These crosses are amino acids which cannot be identified from triplets because one of their nucleotides, not even third one, sometimes even the second one, second nucleotide of the triplet is deleted in the gene. And these deletions are somehow corrected during the transcription process. So the resulting protein is okay, but the gene is not okay. And because of these numerous deletions, it is very hard to develop universal primers. It is very hard to develop primers at all. In many cases, we fail. In general, mycologists who speak with myxomycetologists about primers must understand that we myxomycetologists do not have universal primers at all. You cannot develop universal primer 
for the 18S rRNA gene, even within some genera. Even within some genera, you need several different primer pairs to sequence one of the most conservative genes of the eukaryotic genome. With such a huge level of genetic variability, myxomycete phylogeny is very late. We are late for five to 10 years after the mainstream of the phylogenetic researches of eukaryotes. The first myxophylogeny was published in 2005 by Anna Maria Fioradona with her colleagues. And this phylogeny supported the classification of Josef Tomasz Rostofinsky, published in 19th century, in which he divided all the myxomycetes on, uh, on two groups, Amorospora, dark spore, and Lamprospora, bright spore. Indeed, myxomycetes were separated on two branches, one with melanized spores, and another with not melanized spores, which can be white, yellow, red, orange, brown, but not dark melanized brown. In the first phylogeny, the group of primitive myxomycetes, Echinostelialis, the order Echinostelialis, looked as a common ancestor of the rest of myxomycetes, but the subsequent studies has shown that Echinostelialis are related with dark sporad clade. Some of them contain melanin, some don't, but they still belong to this clade. In 2013, Cavalier Smith, based on phylogenies published by Fioradona in previous years, has separated myxomycetes on two super orders, Columelidia and Lutzesporidia. Lutzesporidia are bright sporad. Columelidia are those who contain columella. This is a good term which unites dark sporad mixos and these primitive echinostelialis, which may be dark sporad or not, but they are similar with dark sporad mixos because they also contain columella within fruiting body. In 2019, Based on the full 18S rRNA gene phylogeny and the rest of published phylogenies, including those which were based on partial SSU and uh, EF1 alpha and the COX1, our research group has published the first phylogenetic classification of myxomycetes in which we provided two subclasses of the botanical nomenclature based on the super orders of Cavalier Smith, Lutzosporo Mitzitide, and Columello Mitzitide. Four new super orders, nine orders among which three were new and one re-erected, and 13 families in which one was new and two were re-erected. Among the taxonomic uh, transformations we provided. Uh, the most important were that Lamprodermatisia, the family which includes the most beautiful and well-known myxomycetes, which always win contests of scientific photographs because they are really one of the most beautiful creatures in the world. They were transferred to the order Physeralis, which was initially characterized by the presence of lime. Lamprodermatisia mostly do not contain lime in their footing bodies, but there are some exceptions. However, the phylogeny has shown that these guys still belong to physerans. I will briefly describe the morphological characteristics of the main group of myxomycid in the phylogenetic perspective based on the results of our study made in 2019. So, Protostelloid ancestors of myxomycetes looked like this. This is representative of the family Protosporangiasia, which belongs to the related class Serazio myxomycetes. They produced fruiting bodies with only one spore, and the plasmodium produced many of fruiting bodies like this. 
And this spore is elevated on the so-called primary stalk, which is excreted, targetly excreted from the surface of the spore when it is immature. The first group of myxomycetes, Echinostele oxidacea, forms already several spores and some kind of very thin and evanescent peridium, but still these spores are elevated on the primary stalk. The next group, Echinostelaceae, form a somewhat larger fruit in bodies, but still microscopic. You cannot see them without a good lens. They form a peridium, which is evanescent, and they start to form some kind of columella, a structure uh, which unites the stalk and the sporotheca, uh, maybe for just for mechanical reasons. The most primitive sporotheca is formed by just one spore which remains attached to the stalk. The very important step was the formation of capillicium. Capillicium, the primary capillicium, is formed by the vacuolar tubules within the cytoplasm of sporotheca. Before spores are formed, there is a cytoplasm which will not be included in any spore. And this cytoplasm was used to form tubular structures, which first hold spores together and then help to disperse them by slow portions. So the capillicium was formed and it was attached to the top of the primary stalk. And this is a structure which we can see in the most developed representatives of Echinostelaceae. Some of them even contain melanin, as Barbiella you can see on this picture. Then the very interesting thing has happened. Capillicium reached out of the sporotica and tried to form the upper part of the stalk, while the lower part was still created by the excretion of the material outside the sporotheca. In this nice cluster there at the baryanum, you can clearly see the point where the capillicium format stalk merges to the excretion format stalk. Capillicium format stalk is harder, is more elastic, and needs less amount of material. So in the next family, Meridermatasia, the primary stalk disappeared at all, and the whole length of the stalk was formed by the capillicium. This type of structure we call secondary stalk. Another thing that secondary stalk allowed to make sporocarps larger because it can hold a bigger weight, a bigger amount of spores. In this situation, the peridium, which also can take these spores, can hold them together while they are maturing, must be thicker. And if you have the thicker peridium, when spores become mature, this peridium must be broken somehow to release spores. The first principle which is used in the family Meridermatasia is the splitting of the peridium onto the small lobes which are connected to the uh, tips of capillicium branches. Another principle was used in families Lampredermatasia, Stimonitidacia, and Amorohitacia. In these myxomycetes, peridium is not connected to the tips of capillicium branches. And it becomes evanescent and just disappears so that you can hard, hardly find any remnant of it, or remains as a filmy cover, which is irregularly broken and uh, blown up from the mature sporocarp. And the very well-developed system of capillicium threads can be seen inside.
Those myxomycetes which accumulate calcium salts, which accumulate lime, also have some achievements in sporocarp formation. In some unknown species, the secondary stalk and capillicium disappeared. This may happen, for example, when myxomycetes form fruiting bodies on the tree bark. In this case, they don't need they don't need stalks because the trunk of the tree works as a stalk. And when the tree bark dries, it it makes it very quickly, and the life cycle shortens so that myxomycetes which live on the tree bark can produce only very small and very simplified fruiting bodies. This is one of the reasons which could lead to the loss of the stalk and capillicium. And then descendants of this hypothetic group created a new stalk and new capillicium. This new stalk, I call it tertiary, was produced by the peridium. At the base of the fruiting body, portion of peridium is narrowing and forming a kind of tube. Sometimes even spores appear within this tube. And this tube comes as another stalk and allows myxomycetes to create a large fruiting bodies again. The same story with capillicium, after the loss of capillicium, the peridium has formed these tubes which were coming inside the fruiting body. And they can even be filled with the salts of calcium accumulated on the surface of fruiting body and inside the tertiary stalk. In this case, you can find in the family Physeracea, lime salts, lime accumulations can be found in all uh, parts of the fruiting body, including surface of the peridium, inner space of the capillicell tubes, and inner space of the stalk. Situation in bright spore myxomycetes is somewhat simpler because their common ancestor lost the stalk and did not develop capillicium or also lost it in very early stages. So the first archetype of bright spore myxomycetes did not contain any structures like primary or secondary stalk or primary capillicium. It start, they started their evolution from the tertiary stalk of the peridial origin. Then they needed somehow to elaborate the spore dispersal. The first strategy they used is the perforation of the peridium, which we can see also on this nice photograph. The perforation of the peridium allows only small portions of dry spores come out while immature spores, which are still uh, wet and heavy and glued to each other, cannot be released and they just wait for their maturing. Another idea, another strategy was to develop secondary capillicium in the same way as bright spore myxomycetes did. This tubular capillicium was discovered in Alvisia Lloydi, a species we described by our research group, and also by Alvisia bombarda, a species known before, but the meaning of these structures were misunderstood before our studies. Then in many of bright sport myxomycetes, this tubular capillicium was lost again and again by different reasons, for example, by developing on tree bark or by developing a combined fortifications. All these different reasons led to the loss of secondary capillicium in many representatives of bright sport myxomycetes. But those which still have it formed a very elaborated tubular capillicium with nice bright ornamentation, an example you can see here uh, is a genus Trichia, in which these ornamented tubules of capillicium are not uh, connected to the peridium anymore and uh, represent so-called elaters, which are formed within the spore mass.
These were general things about the morphological evolution of myxomycetes as we understand it based on the recent phylogenetic data. These morphological considerations are not yet published. I am planning to write a special paper about this. If we go even deeper, let's consider the family Reticulariaceae, which is the main topic of my research. This is one of the eldest families of myxomycetes, described by Rostofinsky also, our classical researcher. But the first description of species of Reticulariaceae belong to the 70th and 80th century. This is really old taxon. And this is understandable because representatives of reticulariaceae are very large as for myxomycetes. Their fruiting bodies are centimeters or even tens of centimeters large. And in immature stage, they are very, very bright. And in the forest on the dark wet wood, you can see bright orange or bright pink fruiting bodies. So they were found and described in very old times. In traditional classification of Reticulariaceae, they were only three genera, Lycogala, one of the most known myxomycetes at all, Reticularia and Tubifera. You can see them on photographs below. The family was characterized by uh, several clearly morphological characters. They all have combined fruitifications, so not individual sporocarps, but a number of merged sporocarps. Sometimes you can still see them as in tubifera. All these small rounds are individual sporocarps. Sometimes you cannot see them at all as in reticularia. They all don't have stalks. They all are covered by thin membranaceous peridium. Their spores can be reticulately or very closely ornamented. They don't have true capillicium, but they have so-called pseudocapillicium. Pseudocapillicium are just remnants of the walls of individual sporocarps. After several years of our studies, all these lists of characters, which you can find in any identification book, was corrected. We have found that reticulation may be represented by simple sporocarps, not only combined. They may have stalks, including a secondary stalk and so-called hypotelic stalk, quaternitary type number four. There are different types of peridium, not only membranaceous, but also coriaceous and cartilaginous. Spores uh, from the other side can be only reticulate, and all the representatives which have varicose spores do not belong to this family. Capillicium can be found, and it is normal in the genus Lycogala, and it is normal in some other genera which were described or revalidated by us. As for the pseudocapillicium, it still can be found, but in most cases, the structures which were called pseudocapillicium appear to be a true capillicium. So we change it strongly, considerably, even the description of the family. As for the genera and species of this family, in this picture, you can see what we have done already. For some species like Tubifera ferruginosa or Tubifera microsperma, one species was separated on many. Here, by the way, I did not include three species described uh, last year, which uh, even four. Uh, so the number of X to be ferroferobinosa is even bigger. In some cases, representatives of the genus to be were transferred to other genera, genus Cephotichium, which we re-erected and enriched by two new species, and the genus Alvisia, which we re-erected and enriched by three new species. 
and the genus Lycetalium, which we re-erected. And the last year, Yukimori Yamamoto also created new combination uh, for this uh, genus based on uh, our data. And so on and so forth. The project I'm working on right now is about Lycogala, where three related species, Confusum, Epidendrum, and Exigum, seems to represent over 40 biological species still to be described. Within the phylogeny of Reticularia, we see four clades of the X tubiferous. Three of them are related, but separated by rather long branches. These are tubifera, cephatichium, and olivisia. And the third one is not even related to the rest. And this is a new genus we described in uh, 2019 called Teco tubifera. For the genus Reticularia, we have found that all the representatives of this genus, which have varicose spores, belong to another family, family Cribraria, and therefore cannot be considered within the genus Reticularia. And we re-erected the genus Lysetalium for them. Now this genus is already included in uh, some identification handbooks. And the last new species. Here you can see the new species of tubifera we described. All these descriptions were based on molecular data, but we all understand that the new taxon, which has only molecular characteristics and no morphological characteristics, is useless. Even if this taxon exists in reality, we cannot handle with it. We cannot use it in the regular biodiversity researches. So we need new morphological characters. And I was looking for them very seriously and realized that for tubifera, the most important are the color of immature fortifications, which can be red, yellow, orange, salmon color, flesh color, and so on. Another, the surface where you can see the tips of individual sporocarps. This is a uh, merged foot in body, so-called pseudo And on its surface, you can see the tips of individual sporocarps. And their shape is very taxonomically important. And the last character is the inner surface of the peridium, which can be ornamented by the rings, by the craters, by the folds, or can be nearly smooth. I want to emphasize that before our research, these 10 species you see on the screen were considered as only one species, to be fair, through genosa. Sometimes I wonder how blind scientists can be if they just believe to the books when they open the identification textbook go to the identification key and see, okay, if I see these characters, this is to be ferroferogenosa. And different specimens of these species look so different, but the identification book tell you that, oh, this is to be ferroferogenosa. Okay, I agree with this and forget it. Another group, Cephoptichium and Tecotubifera. Interesting character for Cephoptichium when you see the pseudoitalium and try to break it. If it breaks within sporocarps, this is tubifera. If it breaks between sporocarps, this is cephoptichium. And if it breaks that way that the surface part is heated as a one piece, this is tecotubifera. Important characters here are columellas, which can be branched or unbranched, and can be tubular or solid and reticular, like here. For the genus Alvisia, first one, which was known before, known for a long time, and three, one described by us. They include such a characters as a shape of Sparteca, the presence of Capilicium, and its ornamentation. These are simplest characters, but characters like this were used in mixomycytology for a long for a long time. So this is nothing unusual. You can just use a normal principles 
mixomorphology and identify these species. And the last one, my beloved Likogala, with which I am working for three years already and extremely far from the end. This is picture I made, I think, two years ago. And here there are only 20 ribo groups, which are far enough from each other to represent a biological species. And this is also supported by the COX-1 phylogeny. So we have two independent genetic markers. So here there are 20. Now we have already 42. And recently we received new sequences from the new regions, including China, and there are also several new. So I think that what was called Lycogala epidendrum is represented in the world by at least 60 different species, maybe even more. Why they were considered as only one species? Because the species is too well known. Everybody know what is Lycocola epidendrum. Every expert who works with myxomycetes mostly do not even collect specimens of Lycogola when he finds them in the forest. It's like agroecologists do not collect uh, Amanita muscaria and uh, aphylophorologists do not collect Fomus fomentarius and mixomycetologists do not collect Lycogola epidendrum. And they were wrong because it appeared to be not only genetically diverse, but also morphologically diverse, if you are attentive enough. For example, different Lycogolas have different pigments in the immature fructifications. They can be yellow, pink, salmon, almost red, and so on. They have rather different ornamentation of this on the surface of the peridium, and even different colors from black to light yellow. But the most important is that when you take the peridium of the fruiting bodies under microscope, you see a lot of different structures. And these are structures never described before. We described them in the paper, which is nearly published in Nova Hedvikia in this year, 2022. Before our studies, there were only three types of peridium ornamentation described single vesicles. These vesicles are cells formed by the remnants of the cytoplasm uh, released on the surface of the peridium when the sporocarp matures. So these vesicles can be free, they can merge together, and they can form such a tough complexes. Our research have shown that these vesicles can contain individual crystals, Druses of crystals, oil droplets, pigmented oil droplets, biofringian oil droplets, granules, pigment accumulations. And from outside, they are also very different. They can be ornamented. They can have only one layer walls or several layer walls and the outer layer can be smooth or granulated or ornamented. All these variants are available. For me, the most exciting discovery is discovery of crystals, which can be seen only in the polarized light. I have discovered this accidentally. I just turned the condenser of the microscope to the polarized light to see details of these vesicles better. And I was really surprised to see such plenty of beautiful colors within every brown vesicles. The chemical analysis we made with the help of our biochemists here in Greifswald has shown that these crystals contain calcium. So maybe this is a kind of lime but lime accumulations are very unusual within bright spore myxomycetes. And calcium accumulations were never discovered within peridial vesicles or any other vesicular structures on the peridium among bright spore myxomycetes. In 
Dark spore myxomycetes, something like this can be found within the genus Physarum. The thing I'm working on right now is ornamentation of the Capillicium, which is also extremely diverse. You can see the coralloid structures on the surface. You can see rings here. You can see different kinds of folds. You can see different kinds of uh, labyrinth-like ornamentation or even almost smooth surfaces with uh, small perforations. And also I want to remind you that all these before our research was considered as one species. And all this diversity of ornamentation was never described before. I will not do any conclusions other than you already saw on the first slide. Myxomycetes are taxonomic clondike, and there is a plenty of discoveries yet not made. Thank you for your kind attention.